Hello, hello! Welcome back to Road Tripping with Rachel. I'm Rachel, so welcome to joining me on this road trip as I work my way through the Bible, through life, and at my times while I'm out on the road. We're going to be seeing all parts as we are going through Vlogmas, so hopefully you enjoyed the video that aired yesterday and the day before and the day before that, because today is Vlogmas Day 4. Yes, that's right. We are four days into Vlogmas and I am super excited. I am here to continue on with the little mini series about the 12 days of Christmas. So last time we on Vlogmas day two, we actually talked about the partridge in a pear tree. Well, now we're talking about how my true love gave to me two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. So we are going to be talking about the two turtle doves today and I am ready because I have got my Mrs. Claus mug, which just fun side story. I got this mug from some friends of mine whenever I was attending seminary because I crochet and I knit and I embroidery. I'm basically an 80 something year old lady, although I've been saying that now for a decade. I'm probably actually somewhere in my 90s now and I truly enjoy all the little old lady things. I would love to learn how to tat. For you, those of you who don't know, that's basically like making the really delicate um, in, um, crochet that is at around like baby blankets and things like that. It's lovely, it's beautiful. And some friends thought it would be funny for Christmas for me to have a Mrs. Clogs mug. So this is my official Christmas mug. And it is out and it, we are enjoying it. I normally use this for cocoa. Right now there is coffee in it and it is delicious. Thank you. This has been your public service announcement. Okay, so back to something serious. So two turtle doves. So if you watched the previous video in our mini series about the 12 days of Christmas, I talked about how um, when Jesus was dedicated to the temple. His parents actually brought doves in because they were too poor to afford a lamb. But when within the context of when the 12 days of Christmas became widely circ um, like circulated, turtle doves would have been expensive. So a partridge was just a much more practical gift for someone to give within the context of the song. Well, now, Rachel, they're giving turtle doves. I thought you said those were expensive. And they are because the turtle doves actually are relating to the Old and New Testament. Thousands of years worth of literature written, actually probably not thousands, more like maybe two, um, or like 1500 if we want to like just split it and call it. So expensive, right? Because when we are talking about the Old and the New Testament, we are talking about medieval times, which meant that they would have been written on paper. People probably hadn't read, uh, memorized them. And when we're talking about the Septuagint, which is sometimes referred to if you're reading about it as the LXX, which is um, the Greek version of Torah or the Old Testament, and then which would have been written in Greek the Old Testament would have originally have been written in Hebrew and then Daniel would have been partially in Aramaic. The New Testament is written completely in Greek. So um, it would have been written down, which meant it would have been expensive, which meant that the average person would not have been able to afford it, to have afforded it. And that means you only would have been able to have found versions either in the very wealthy's homes or like a copy within a church. And by I mean a copy within a church, I am not talking about your little parishes. I am talking about a big thriving metropolis like London, Paris, Munster. Like, okay, we're talking like Berlin. We're talking like major epicenters of culture would have had a written version of the Bible. There would have been some like in the surrounding areas, but your little small parishes would not have had them. Okay. And even after the Reformation, although scripture became widely more available and it was given back to the people and books were becoming more attainable, they were still relatively expensive above and beyond what the average family would have been able to have afforded until we got the Gutenberg Press. Okay. I actually have a magnet of the Gutenberg Press. It's really cool. Um, revolutionized. Uh, availability of books and I love happen to love reading even in the technology age where a lot of my fun books are actually on my phone now okay uh, so we're looking at a totally different type of bird still super practical though a bit more expensive which is why it's referred to as the Old and New Testament now 
we have, I need to make sure like I speak correctly to this because within the Protestant Bible, we have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament, 66 books. So we have some, the Old Testament is pre birth of Christ. New Testament accounts for the gospels, which is the birth of Christ and his life through his death and resurrection. And then the early years of the church, as well as the letters of Paul and Peter uh, and John, which helps the church actually actively develop its theology moving forward. We have not added to it since we finalized the canon. And we have, when we're talking about the Old Testament, it is consistent with the uh, books that are used by the Jewish people. Now, there is also the Apocrypha, which takes place um, during the intertestamental times. Now, the Protestants, we do not include that because it, we, it does not meet the criteria for it to be considered canon based on the Christian viewpoint. However, um, when we're talking Protestants, however, um, it is often included within the Catholic Bibles. And then it is also often used as, if not considered like holy writings, at least like sacred writings amongst our Jewish brothers and sisters. So, um, they make up the pro since the, the 300 something is when the canon was done. I don't remember that date off the top of my head. I used to be able to just say it. I want to say like maybe 367. That sounds close somewhere in there. Um, I would have to go back and review it, which I didn't do for this video. I'm sorry. The general point is 300 something was when the canon was finalized. That's what's important. So a canon, it is the measuring rod. So in other words, it is the standard. The reason we don't include the Apocrypha is because it doesn't, it did not traditionally meet that standard. And for our Catholic brothers and sisters out there, the Apocrypha was not actually included until the Catholic Church underwent its own Reformation, separate from the Protestant Reformation after the death of Martin Luther. So there's your little bit of history lesson that's included in here. So with the Old and New Testament, why is this such an important gift? You will meet some Christians out there who would say, well, we don't need the Old Testament. Like it's useless because it's all before Jesus. And now that we have Jesus, we only need to worry about the New Testament. I would argue that that is incorrect. And then you would have people who would say, well, we don't actually need the Pentateuch because all it is is about law. And God is a God of love. We don't need law. Once again, I would argue that that is incorrect. I wrote an entire paper on why I think that the, that is incorrect. And then we also have people who are like, it's just old school. We don't need it anymore. After all, you know, um, the, they have laws within the Old Testament that just aren't applicable to, the day, to today. Once again, I would argue that I see where you're coming from. However, also incorrect. Okay, so let's, because I think I can sum up all of why I would say that that is incorrect, all within one answer. So when, it, when we're talking about that we've already got, we've now got Jesus, we don't need the Old Testament, that it's just a bunch of laws, we don't need it. And when we're talking about that there are a bunch of useless laws, so therefore we don't need it, I think we can round this all up in saying that its purpose for the modern Christian, because what it says does not change, how it is applied can change, okay? So why do we need the Old Testament? We need the Old Testament because it explains to us why we need Jesus. End of the conversation. So why do we need Jesus? Well, if you were to go all throughout the Old Testament, you would see that we can that it outlines if you've been paying attention to my series I've been doing through Genesis I'm planning on the new year we're going to launch into Exodus um, it's going to take a while but we're going to make it through the Pentateuch um, but with that though we need to really be conscious and and aware of the fact that part of the purpose of the Pentateuch is to show us why we need Christ. So just as a quick rundown, you know, God creates everything. We know this. He speaks it into being um, man sins. We decided we wanted to be our own God. And so therefore we end up 
uh, you know, doing exactly what God tells us not to do. And we have, we are currently living out the consequences of our forefathers, uh, choices. Okay. I think we can all agree on that. I would love to be running around without having to be covered in a bunch of clothes because I get hot and something just tells me it would be more comfortable to just not have to worry about it. Uh, also because we are now simple, you know, and that means that because it's not just like, oh, we do bad things. It is our minds are sinful, our bodies are sinful. We have to face consequences that aren't necessarily always our fault. Sometimes we are the people who cause the issues. Sometimes we face the consequences of our issues that other people caused. Uh, but we have to live with it. And that is why we need the Old Testament is because it makes us realize that we are dirty, filthy people. And that there is absolutely nothing that we are ever going to be able to do that is going to be able to bring us to a point where we can stand before an almighty God and say, you should let me in because I'm a cool person. That doesn't work because even the coolest person on the planet is still going to have bad thoughts. They're still going to like be angry with people. They're still going to have people that they don't like and they hate. They're still going to speak bad about other people. They're still going to not treat their spouses right. They're going to do things and screw up their kids. Like even the coolest person on the planet and the most righteous of all these people. I mean, hello, Moses, John the Baptist, Daniel, Joseph in his coat of many colors. Joseph in his coat of Technicolor dream coat. Great musical. Um, not biblical at all, but I enjoy it. Uh, you know, like even for all these great men that we see throughout scripture, there really aren't any that are have get to wear a purely white hat. I mean, I'm pretty sure Daniel and Joseph probably come the closest to it. Because, I mean, even Noah royally screws up. And then uh, we have Elijah, who doesn't die, gets to go up to heaven in a chariot of fire. And even he was, like, trying to curse God and die. He's like, I should have never been born. And God's just like, eat something and take a nap, Elijah. And then he does. And then suddenly everything is so much better. Okay. We need God. We need that person and, and that we found in Jesus Christ who was able to pay, make that payment that we could not pay because someone who is dirty and sinful cannot die for someone else who's dirty and sinful. It needs to be something that is innocent in order to cover up the sin that we commit. Jesus was innocent and he died on the cross in order to save us from our sins. And then he was buried and rose again on the third day. He paid the sin for anyone who wishes to accept the gift that God has given to them, which I think is appropriate for Christmas time for us to be discussing this. That is why we need the Old Testament. It shows us who we are and how bad we are and why we need God. Second argument that people have is just a bunch of laws. Okay, best explanation I ever heard of this was from a professor while I was in seminary, uh, Dr. Uh, N. Blake Hearson. So Dr. Hearson, if you are watching this, I still remember your examples. I paid attention in class. I had Dr. Hearson for both Hebrew and I had him for Old Testament survey, which at the seminary level is much more intense than at the college level. I'm just going to throw that out there. But he gave the example of whenever you are in a marital relationship there are unspoken rules it's not like you write down the rules of your household anywhere you might do that for kids but normally within a spousal merit a spousal relationship you're not sitting there and saying you will do laundry on tuesdays you will forever and always make sure that you separate your colors from your whites and within the colors you do the blue jeans separately and make sure that you separate the delicates regardless of color. And the colored delicates have to be done separately from the white delicates. If you're not a female, you probably don't understand how important that is. But it is important. You will always take the trash out on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We will negotiate on Saturday and Sundays. You don't write those down. You don't. But there are things that are understood. And Dr. Hearson told the story of a student who would put his socks on the counter, his dirty socks on the counter. It is understood within a marriage relationship that 
at least this examples, that you don't put dirty socks on the counter. Why don't you put dirty socks on the counter? Because you know it irritates your wife. And it's disgusting. And it's just plain nasty. You don't do it. Now, can you do it? Obviously, this man did. Should you do it? No. This is what the Old Testament teaches. Whenever we're reading through the Pentateuch, we are seeing that because this is our God and we are his people. Now, they're referring specifically to the Jewish people at this point. But because he is their God, they are his people. There is an appropriate way in which we are going to interact. Look at your spousal relationships. There is an appropriate way that you are going to interact with your spouse. And there is an appropriate way that you are going to interact with people who are not your spouse. It's the same concept. The Old Testament, particularly the Pentateuch, explains to us that because God is holy and separate from us, but understands what we are going through and we are his creation because he loves us and we want to be his people and we want to be as close to him as we possibly can be, there is a way for us to interact with him in a way that is appropriate. Because even though when we look at the New Testament, we can say that, yes, you know, I am a child of God now. I can go before him. He is my king. I can be in front of him. I can go to him with my wants and my needs. And I can just like lay it all out for him. He is still God. He is not your homeboy. He is not, uh, I hate daddy God. Do I understand it? Yes. Do I think it's appropriate? No. If you need to refer to God like that, fine. Please don't do it when you pray publicly because it's distracting and it just sounds really uncomfortable. But that is how we are able to relate. That there is an appropriate way for us to relate to God and that we are sinful people and that is why we have to have this appropriate way to interact with him. And finally... The other issue that people always bring up, oh, well, those aren't, those don't matter anymore because we got the New Testament. Okay, so I wear rayon and polyester. I would just like to say that there are definitely laws in the Old Testament that say you don't do that. I like to have cream whenever I am uh, sometimes making some of my meals. I happen to really like curry. Occasionally I will use cream in that. Normally I use coconut milk, but occasionally, you know, you use whatever you have in your house and what's ever in your fridge. And I happen to be a lover of bacon. I really like bacon. Okay. There are rules that are moral, such as the Ten Commandments. And then there are rules that are like social rules, cleanliness rules. Um, they are rules that were very specifically meant for a certain time in which it was to make them be separate from the cultures that were surrounding them. So like there, uh, I don't think anyone would disagree that like you shouldn't kill someone. Just, just in general, like you don't, you don't murder them. Um, and there is like, there is a difference between to kill and to murder. They're two separate words. They're talking about something that's very personal. Like I went out and murdered somebody that's, that's personal. That is like, you did it with intent. They are not talking about, I took a life during war. Uh, there are rules within the old Testament about like, how do you handle if there is an accident that happens and a woman who's pregnant gets hurt and they lose the baby over it. Like they're, they have rules and like societal rules and laws for how do we go about handling that. Now, does that look different today? Yes, because we are living in a completely different culture. We're living in a completely different time. I do not have to worry about an oxen coming through the front door of my apartment and trying to skewer me, mainly because there are no oxen in where I live at. There are cattle and they have their horns removed because they're all dairy cows up here, okay? Like, this, this isn't an issue that I have to deal with, okay? We don't have um, cities where you run to if you are supposed to be, if you are worried that you accidentally killed someone and it was an error and you need to run there. So that way that, that is a place wherever you will be able to have the law 
um, applied and like be protected. Now, I live in the US. Yes, we have sanctuary cities. That is a totally different concept than what we are currently talking about. Um, but likewise, like they didn't have gun control laws. We've got gun control laws here. Like, uh, now that's a whole issue that a bunch of people probably have very strong opinions on. I'm just using it as an example here. Uh, so there are moral laws and then there were societal laws that were there. At the end of the day, the moral laws are the ones that we want to continue to carry forth with. Uh, we don't necessarily have to worry about some of the societal laws that take place. Now, that does not mean that they are 100% obsolete. Um, there are some that still have a reasonable application today. Like, just in case you haven't picked up, uh, I am not pro-abortion. I'm just going to throw it out there. You know, we can have that conversation at a completely later time, but this is my stance on it. I ask you to be respectful of that. But, um, you know, I, we can all agree, though, that that baby is, or fetus, whatever you want to call it, is innocent. And that uh, if you hurt a woman who did not want to have an abortion and now has to suffer like through a miscarriage that there should be some kind of um something should be done in that situation the bible had it set up so something could be done in that situation we as a society have things in place if something happens in that particular situation how do you handle um if someone you you hurt someone's spouse Okay, like there are things that are put in place that have like a social equivalent to it. Moses ends up setting up judges. Have it, has anyone actually taken a look at our judicial system? Like, it's Moses. It's literally Moses. You have your counties. Actually, you have your city. Then you have your county. And then you have your circuit courts. And then your state courts. And then you have the Supreme Court. I mean... It is how Moses set it up, okay, people? Like, <laughs> like there, it is still applicable, the things that we see. And once we make it past the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, if I hadn't said that already, I know I've said it in pretty, previous videos. If we make it past there, then we see how mankind is still screwed up and how they aren't following the laws that God has given them. Because even though God loves us, and loves them and we are and you have people who are trying to live in that covenant relationship with him that they are still messed up and they're screwed up and it shows us that we need Jesus and we need that gift of salvation and we need to be forgiven of the bad things that we do and the sins that we commit and the sins that we're going to be committing that is why the two turtle doves are so precious because they were expensive and they're still expensive. It took a lot of people, a lot of years to write the Old and the New Testament, but it is full of wisdom and it's a record of how badly we need God. Because I'm a sinner and you're a sinner and we all sin, but God gave the gift of Jesus Christ, that partridge to die on that tree. So that all of those who accept the gift that is given are able to have salvation and to be forgiven of the sins that they have committed. I'm going to end it there for today. I hope that you enjoyed our second in the mini series of the 12 days of Christmas. Make sure that you have liked and subscribed so that way you can continue seeing more about this series and then see all of the other fun things that I'm going to be doing over Vlogmas as we keep on going. I will see y'all tomorrow. Bye!